You've been watching the VIF short form program one at the 40th edition of the Vancouver International Film Festival. My name is Curtis Wallace Chuck. I'm the Associate Director of Programming for VIF, and I'm very excited to be joined by the filmmakers responsible for the work you've just seen. Uh, we have Lewis Bennett with us from Canucks Riot One, Teresa Elfid, Elfeld from Gene Swanson, We Need a New Map, Amanda Cassidy from Solitary Skies, Jenny Williams from Nella Hook Knight, and Courtney Montour from Mary Tuax Early, I Am Indian Again. Thank you all so much for joining us. Maybe, uh, Teresa, I'll begin with you, because I'm not sure how everyone else's layout is, but uh, you're, uh, you're first on my, uh, my screen here. Um, maybe, can you speak a little bit to uh, a relationship uh, with Jean Swanson, if you had one before this, and uh, how you kind of came into her orbit initially, and, uh, and how you found your way to, to making this profile of her? Yeah, absolutely. I first met Jean Swanson, it would have been before the 2010 Olympics. I was doing videography with this company. Um, that covered a lot of social justice events and we covered uh, the poverty Olympics. And I remember seeing Jean come into Carnegie Center and start talking about anti-poverty activism in a language I'd never heard before. And she just took my breath away. Um, from that point on, we, we sort of had a casual collegial friendship, um, but I reconnected with her when I made uh, my first documentary, my first feature documentary, uh, The Rankin File about Harry Rankin, her old colleague. Um, I was lucky and fortunate enough to interview Jean for that project. And since then we, we kept in touch and I always knew I wanted to do a project about her because again, I am just humbled and inspired by her activism. And then when the, um, hot doc citizen minutes program came by, uh, I was inundated, uh, with emails from colleagues saying, oh, this is the opportunity to make the gene piece. Um, so it was a natural, uh, a natural, uh, evolution from there. So yeah, I've known Jean forever. Um, always been just so, uh, incredibly, like I said, inspired by her work and, and was just grateful to get to finally spotlight her incredible um, and very um, not well-known uh, history of activism in, in the city. Was she, uh, was she receptive to the idea right away? I mean, she's a commanding not, yet no. unassuming uh, figure. God, no, not at all. Jean is, um, I said, I said I was humbled by Jean. Jean, Jean is humble herself, incredibly, um, uh celebratory of the movement that she works within and very uh not in favor of work that spotlights individuals um including herself um and so uh to be honest this project was actually pitched to hot doc citizen minutes as a bit of a broader story of activists in vancouver and i was hoping to spotlight three different activists um, however, with the progression of the pandemic, I had to make some um, hard uh, swings uh, towards what was achievable with, um, with respect to pandemic shooting and ultimately landed on a project that was more centering on Jean. And no, she was not excited. <laughs> um, you know, Jean and I, I, I always say to Jean, you know, if you'll allow me to tell a bit of your story, it's really highlighting and spotlighting the incredible history and movement in Vancouver. And so that was the only way that Jean would agree to participate as well as of course, including other voices. And there are other voices in the film, uh, Sara and Ishmam. So um, Jean is an incredibly tolerant and patient individual. Um, and I'm just so grateful that she did allow me into her, into her world and, and to allow this film to be made. Uh, Lewis, you were um, at the festival last year with uh, Canucks Riot 2. This year you return with the prequel, the much anticipated prequel to it. But uh, this, uh, I guess if um, Teresa's film features a, a poor profile of community activism, yours kind of uh, has community destruction at its core. Um, this is a profile of the 94 riots in Vancouver. And um, curious for yourself as a, as a filmmaker, what is your kind of persistent fascination with um, revisiting these events and, and doing so through, through found footage and the stories you can find through that medium? Yeah, I think originally I was just going to make the film about the 2011 riots. The 94 one wasn't as much on my radar. And as I was working on that, um, uh, I was telling some friends about it and different people. And, and a friend said, oh, I've got these tapes of the 94 one. 
and I was like, oh, what do you mean? And it was, it was some tapes that, that he had gotten from uh, a place that he used to work at. And it was stuff that I hadn't seen on, on YouTube or anywhere else. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll check this out and, and just started watching through it and, and sort of made it, I don't know. I felt like a weird obligation to make it or something just because like I had already made this other one and it just felt right. I don't know. It was, um, it felt a little bit like rehashing kind of what I'd done, but it was kind of interesting to see the, um, the sort of difference in time that those 16 years um, in the city and, and uh, what had happened. And, and I think maybe going forward, um, the, the two films might kind of play together in, in a sequence, like one after the other um, is kind of how I see it now. How many, um, how many detours do you find yourself going down uh, when you are assembling these, these found footage documentaries? Because I imagine there's many pathways one could take. It usually starts with just sort of watching through, there wasn't as much footage for this one as there was for the 2011 riots, just because there weren't cell phones and YouTube and all that kind of stuff at the time. But um, yeah, I kind of start watching through all the footage and making notes in, in the software. Um, and it's usually just stuff that kind of makes me laugh, makes me kind of s s like frustrated, annoyed, like all these different things. It's, it's a kind of a slow, process in that way um, and then yeah uh, there are so many ways you can take it and and uh, I, I don't know if there's an answer for how, how I know when it's working or not it's just kind of it sort of starts to feel right in sec sections and slowly slowly more of the film starts to come together I guess. Amanda am I correct that this was your first kind of foray into uh, into animation? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I know you're a visual artist as well, and I, uh, I saw a listing for an Imagined Lands um, exhibition you had a few years ago, and I think your artist statement there uh, said, uh, um, I try to show what is hidden, what I view as the unseen, not looked upon, let's see together, look, contemplate, feel. And I think it ties into, you know, the landscape study we see in, in Solitary Skies, but it also feels like a a film that's a bit of a, an invent, invitation in for the viewer as well. And I was just wondering how how you conceived it, and and maybe you know your your path to, uh, into into animation as well with this film. Um, yeah, uh, I kind of conceived of it like last year with kind of the darkness of everything falling upon the world, and I kind of was thinking about just storms in general. Um, most of my work surrounds storms and nature and it kind of felt like everything felt really stormy and I was I kind of wanted to create something that made you feel like it was okay to be inside of the storm and that it would pass and you would kind of get out of it at some point and so working on the animation last year was a huge learning curve um, just because I'd never really done it before but I'd always been interested in turning my landscape illustrations just into full moving pictures. <laughs> um, so it was kind of like diving into that sort of world. Um, and the like feeling with people, like most of my work has to do, I get really influenced by synesthesia and sound. And so a lot of my work or the way that I view the world relates back to like different noises and sensations. And so when making this kind of film, it's like, there's pieces that you see or that I see that I kind of like, I feel different in different parts of my body. And it was kind of like trying to bring you into this world so that you might be able to like sense that feeling and notice one thing over here and then realize other things are changing around you in a different space and kind of like bringing you into that world where there's a lot going on, but you can also like feel kind of calm within it in a way. That's really interesting. Yeah, I think there's a real kind of grounding element to the film as well. I'm not sure if it's the the use of kind of the the circle um, lens as well, or the landscape at the bottom as well. But it does feel you feel anchored at all times. Yeah, yeah, it's supposed to kind of make you feel grounded, even though everything kind of could be get like gets into that point of chaos where it's like more tumultuous and. Um, but then that it just like releases and then you're like, oh, like that feeling of breathing again. And you're like, it's things are OK. And um, I love that sense in nature as well. And so trying to represent it within like this, my own art was um, it's challenging because I mean, the world's so beautiful and it's like 
who needs to try and represent it when you could just be within it, you know, but kind of that sense of like laying down on a hill and just like looking at the sky, you know, and just watching and just being present. And that's what I want, like, that's what I wanted it to bring to people is that sort of sensation. Uh, Courtney, I know this, um, this film has been uh, a kind of long gestating project as well. It was, uh, I think, put in front of us by the NFB in an incomplete state last year and then uh, had its premiere earlier this year. But um, you, uh, your, your previous short uh, also featured, you know, or focused on an activist. Um, and I know that Eleni Sopam Salwin was uh, a mentor to you on that film. And, uh, and then she provided you really, I think, with the, the audio tapes that were such a strong basis for this film. Is that maybe uh, right to say, is that kind of the really catalytic piece that put this into motion for you? Yeah, I mean, for me, Mary Tuax early uh, is someone who's always been very, very important to me. Uh, we're both Mohawk from Ganawage, the same community, and I've always grown up, you know, hearing her name. Um, but there's not much out there on her, and and to me, she's so important as you know, being a First Nations woman who you know challenged Canadian laws and. Uh, was really part of the Canadian women's rights movement. So she's a pivotal historical figure, but there's not that much out there on her in Canada. And so I always wanted to do a project on her. And it, it was Alan Yusobam's uh, the filmmaker who was mentoring me and uh, Roxanne Whiting on Flat Rocks, another short doc um, about our community. And at that time, she mentioned that she made some recordings with Alanis, uh, sorry, with Mary um, back in 1984. And it was in Mary's kitchen in Ganawage um, over several months. And so that really became kind of like the backbone of the film. It was so precious to have Mary speaking in her own voice um, for this first film on her. And I suppose that also informed your decision of uh, some of the interviews you have in the film. You have the three generations um, sitting at the table as well. And did it um, did it kind of unlock maybe the project for you, uh, or or was it always a matter of finding it over the course of its production and and post production as well to really have a sense of how it would all all fit together? It it was a really interesting process. Um, it, over four years, the film was was created, and everything was always based on these initial audio recordings of of Mary done at home. Just you know, really Mary having the freedom to to speak for herself, and it being so personal. And so every choice from that grew from that, but it also took time. So. Um, I didn't necessarily know in the first two years all the elements that would become part of the movie. One, because it was also very difficult to find um, archives on, on Mary. And, and then the idea to sit around the kitchen table listening to the tapes with Mary's son and with Jody and Isabella from Edmonton, um, that also came later on as well. It was just these elements that, that made sense as we went along that, um, you know, this fight is ongoing today. I can't keep this story in the past. I, I need to show the elements of how it's still impacting uh, First Nations women today. Jenny, um, am I correct? This, you did a photo essay, is that right? Of, uh, that was Nell Hook Knight initially, and, or a photo series rather, and uh, that now um, kind of finds its form in documentary as well? Yeah, I've been taking photos of Nell Hook Knight for 12 years. And then I, um, it's, it's been a few, um, oh, well, a bunch of exhibits and I always get tons of questions about it and like no one's ever seen anything like it. And, and um, I do try to explain it as much as I can from just people seeing photos, but there's just so much to it that I, I thought that making a film will, will help people understand better about Nally of Night and um, it's something that I've always wanted to do is, is make a film. So the last, like I was living in Maine for 12 years and um, taking photos every year of Nellie of Night. And um, the last year I was living there is when I made the film. It's, I said, before I leave, that's what I wanna do. I really wanna make a film. And so I, I got to do it and 
um, I did it a lot like my photographs. Like I did my, I do my photographs in black and white and the film, I also did it in black and white. So um, I wanted to sort of take my photos and like bring them to life. And I wanted to show what it's like being there on the night on the tradition. It still happens every January 6th and it's still really strong tradition in Maine. And um, there hasn't been any film like this made about Nelly of Night ever. And this is the first one. And you can find some things online about Nelly of Night, but nothing like, you know, film or anything made. And it, it'll give people the chance to see something that they would have maybe never had the chance to see. And like Northern Labrador is a really isolated place. And um, it's a really unique tradition. And this gives people a chance to be able to have a glimpse inside Northern Labrador and to see a really amazing tradition that's still strongly celebrated every January 6th. Readily raise my hand and say that I, this was not on my radar whatsoever, uh, this tradition and uh, truly feel privileged to have, uh, to have witnessed it as well. Um, you mentioned that you always wanted to make a film about this uh, as an extension of your photos. Once it came time to actually make that film, uh, did the process seem very natural for you or was there a lot of uh, a lot of investigation, a lot of exploration, a lot of discovery in the actual making of the film? It came really natural, actually, um, because the way I've been taking photos, I learned a lot of things over the years on how to take photos in really cold because it was like minus 40, like over minus 40. And so the tips that I used for taking photos over the years came in handy um, during the filming, um, like the, the batteries would, um, go out really fast. So I would put like these little, um, hand warmers that you, that you can stick on things. And that's what I used to stick on the battery of my camera <laughs> to make it keep going because it's so cold. So that's what we did for the video cameras. We stuck on those warmers all over the, <laughs> the batteries over everything. And then it worked like the first night it didn't work, but I was like, this is what I do with my camera and this, is, and it worked. And, um, and also the way that I wanted to do the film was um, very close to how I take pictures. So I kind of knew, I had an idea of how I wanted to look. So um, using the video cameras was new, but I, I did it exactly how I would take pictures. Like I did the same kind of scenes as I would take pictures of I did I tried to make it as a person in the crowd like I tried to make it so that it would look like somebody was there and walking around in the crowd and experiencing the night for themselves like from my point of view like as a person being there that's well, yeah it's remarkably uh transportive as well like I I feel it's yeah a really remarkable viewing experience so well well done <laughs> um Teresa I was curious to know about um, you know Gene. Gene is such a Vancouver figure in a sense, and yet I think there's something about uh, her tenacity and and resilience that um, is very there's a universal um, lesson to be taken from as well. And I, I'm curious for yourself, like this film had its premiere at Hot Docs. Uh, have you, do you think there is something that that can be drawn from almost any community about how Jean uh, goes about her work and and her commitment to it? Well, I think so. Um, I've obviously mentioned 75,000 times how personally inspiring Jean is to me. Um, and I think obviously, you know, there's sort of a, 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 a I, I think a really positive cultural moment that's happening right now, you know, partly as a result of COVID, partly as, as a result of um, Black Lives Matter and lots of other um, um sources of activism that have taken real progression. Um, the 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 success of, well, semi-success of politicians like Bernie Sanders and AOC, um, wherein Jean's politics in 2021 don't feel radical. They feel obvious. And I've met a lot of folks who learn about Jean and what she like her, what, what she campaigns for, what her politics are, and think, well, duh. Um, so to be able to share the film with people and say, well, actually, uh, Jean has been doing this since 1976, um, and it's been a real uphill, an uphill road. And it's, for me personally, it's, 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 what's the word? 
I, there's something both comforting and distressing about that. There's something comforting in knowing that eventually, um, for folks who's, who have political ideas that, um, make sense that that are about equity and about leveling the playing field and about lifting people up that they will eventually <laughs> um become mainstream there's something comforting in that there's also something incredibly distressing that it takes 40 years for someone like Jean Swanson to be considered um mainstream enough to be elected so i think it's it's a bit of a double edged sword incredibly interesting to be releasing the film now like i said um in the midst of so many different political uh, movements and uh, consciousness raising that, that I think is happening. Um, and so my hope is that uh, folks watch it and think, oh, she had the idea way back then. It's not, these are not radical new ideas. These are ideas that are, are based in um, lived experience and, and uh, science in many ways, political science and just uh, doing the right thing. So that's, yeah, that's, that's certainly my hope with it. Lewis, there's the um, there's a bit of a tonal balancing act in in your documentary as well. I think there's the uh, the very saccharine uh, tone of the newscasters as they talk about uh, just chaos in the streets. Um, and you have like the through line of uh, the super fan as well, who's you know, really seeing the best in the situation, and uh, then the really bizarre um, online chat forum as well uh, with the New York Rangers. Uh, just wondering again about your your editing process and and trying to find like that proper kind of rhythm or counter rhythm uh, tonally for the film to uh, fuse all these disparate uh, elements together. Yeah, I think while I'm watching through footage initially, I'm making a lot of notes and thinking about different types of themes that I might want to incorporate. And um, yeah, I mean, like the the that sort of internet bulletin board sort of pre pre internet um, ad that's in there I was thinking about sort of um, what what the what Vancouver was like in 94 versus now and and just technology changing and so I'm, I'm I've got all these notes of different themes that I'm trying to sort of hit and um, yeah as I'm watching through the footage I'll, I'll try to like throw a clip in sort of to meet some of those things and hopefully not too much of a didactic way um and that's that's part of it i think is is trying to trying to get some of that stuff in the in the piece amanda i know you worked really closely with uh stephen lyons on this um and with i, I know with fond of tigers he's done some live scores for film in the past um but maybe you can just speak a little bit to your collaboration with him and uh you know you mentioned trying to find that that balance the um uh, finding the cues, I guess, for the uh, for the uh, chaotic moments on screen as well. How do the two of you work together? Um, yeah, this was the first piece that we worked on together. And then recently, we actually did another piece more recently. But yeah, working on it together was more, um, it was like doing the animation first, and then kind of taking the music into it afterwards. So um, we actually just like, sat in a room, and I would describe feelings in my body that connected to like a sound I thought that I could hear from the visual effect. So we would kind of go through um, each little part of the animation and talk about how like the beginning is kind of like this land building and trying to find this music where it feels like you're kind of on a stroll or a walk and um, like finding just kind of like a meandering sort of sound. And we kind of just work together by um, like sitting in a room with like keyboards and drums and different things and kind of being like okay like this is the sound that I feel like is this and then kind of like watching the screen and moving over towards like a drum set and like bowing cymbals and like looking be like yeah I think that that's kind of like the sound so it was all very like experimental but um I kind of have like the like sound and visual connection is really important to me in so many different things. Just in general film, it's it's very inspiring. So when we worked together, it was it was mainly just a lot of kind of like experimentation. And um, he always kind of has a few different things going. And so we would we would just kind of sit and play different pieces. And we had a few different things until we settled on the one that we chose. Um, so it was funny because I mean we still watch it and think like, oh, well, we could also put this in there, like you could change it or do anything else. And um, yeah, it was nice to collaborate finally on something and 
and spend some time just exploring different sounds and not traditional sounds, like trying to find different things as well um, and different elements that you could hit or just objects and not necessarily just like, I'm gonna play a keyboard or whatnot, even though that's also involved, but, but just kind of finding like a sonic experience that makes you feel like you're there at the same time, so. Courtney, uh, Teresa talked about, you know, Jean Swanson's kind of years of, of civic service or activism and um, obviously Mary as well, you know, uh, spent the last three decades of her life um, as an activist. And, and as you said, perhaps uh, often with her efforts going uh, undocumented or, or not large, widely documented. Um, I, I feel like your, your film, you know, it, it, it uh, reveals or reminds us how activism takes many different forms, but I think also on the counter side of that reminds us that uh, uh, genocide can take many different forms as well and like even through some bureaucratic means in, in this sense. Yeah, I, there was definitely a lot of similarities in what Teresa was, was saying today. Um, you know, for Mary as well, her work started in the late 60s and it was well documented, you know, at one point, but again, it, it wasn't something that the media or our archival institutions thought to keep, that it wasn't important. And so a lot of times I think that's very telling um, about what's important in our history in Canada and uh, Indigenous stories and First Nations women's stories uh, aren't, aren't that, they don't have that level of importance. And uh, the work that Mary Swapps Early did and all of the women who are part of this movement uh, is something that this, you know, this country should know and should be proud of. Um, and there's, there's inspiration in that as well, um, that we should know because again, these, these policies of assimilation are still ongoing uh, in the Indian Act and in this legislation. So we need to know that First Nations women and their descendants are still experiencing um, you know, many elements of this of the sex discrimination. So it's always important to remember the years, the decades of work that have gone into it and to remember the, the names of Mary Twax Early and the other women who worked alongside her. And you know, what can we all take away from that? And what can we do? And how can that just inspire us to make change in you know, our own communities and our own cities that we all have that capability that Mary had? That's wonderfully said. Uh, Jenny, finally, I know um, I was curious for yourself as a photographer, and I believe you're a, a self-taught or photographer and throat singer as well. Um, when it came time to make your film, was it difficult for you to, was it difficult for you or was it natural for you to work with cinematographers and, uh, and a composer, like kind of handing over some of those elements that you might have, you know, through your own practice, um, thought how to, you know, taking the picture yourself and then instead passing the baton to a to cinematographer to do so for you? Um, I found it really easy because the people that I was working with were really nice and really um, helpful in, in uh, getting my ideas to them and, and transferring it into the film. Like they were um, super helpful and it was actually pretty easy. And they were like, I've seen their work before and I knew that it was like, something similar they they knew how to do what what i wanted so uh, um it was helpful that i watched some of their stuff before and um and also um they came up and they came up to name to shoot and there was two uh camera guys and they were both excellent yeah and then finally the the score for the film as well did that um was that a, a conversation between the two of you as to really how you would uh, enhance the atmosphere of the film through the uh, through the score? I had worked with other people before um, adding throat singing to different music. So I always found that really fun and, and um, a really awesome thing to do. And the girl that I worked with, uh, Sarah Harris with the music, um, all I had to tell her, like I wanted like, sort of a scary theme and like, you know, really uh, exciting and um, fast. And she came up with great music and I went in to do the recording and I recorded um, my, I used my Inuit drum to record some of the beats that were used and also some of the sounds that, that are in, 
in with the music. And I also did the throat singing um, along with the music. And it turned out amazing, like what she did with it and how she put the throat singing together um, with her music. Like, I loved how it turned out. And I, I loved that experience, creating the music myself. Like, um, first we were thinking, oh, what kind of music could we get? And, you know, who could we ask? But I was like, I would love to just make it myself and and just create something myself for the film. And so I'm really happy that I was able to do that. Well, I thank all five of you for uh, for joining us today and talking about your work and for making the films as well. We're so happy to have them as part of the festival. Thank you.